All aboard the Skagway streetcar. Hey! <laughs> and off we go. In this valley, waiting for the gold rush to come. And sure enough, ladies and gentlemen, on August the 17th, 1896, George Washington Carmack, Skookum Jim, and Taggish Charlie are washing their dishes on the edge of the Thronduk River, and they find gold lying thick like cheese in a sandwich. Well, 30 to 40,000 people arrived literally overnight. They just came in in a steady stream. I wanted the gold, and I sought it. Oh, I scrabbled and mucked like a, a slave. Was it famine or scurvy? I fought it. I hurled my youth into a grave. you that if you do need to partake in any refreshing activities, uh, for example, smoking, drinking, eating, spitting, or cussing, please do so in the intermission outside the building. <laughs> All right? August 16th, 1896. Who could have imagined what a day this would be? Slowly, George rotated the pan, spilling a little gravel with each swirl. Eventually, the gravel was gone, and there, curving around the bottom of the pan, was gold, Klondike gold. This simple event triggered the Klondike gold rush. Next day, they staked four claims. Two for George Carmack, the discoverer, and one for each of his companions, Skookum Jim and Taggish Charlie. In the outside world, the economic depression was taking its toll. The dole was commonplace, and no apparent end was in sight. Those who heard about the strike generally dismissed it as being too good to be true. And the Klondike? Well, few knew or cared where it was. The Klondike is situated in the extreme northwest of Canada, close to what was at the time an ill-defined border with Alaska. A major gold strike had been expected here for years. At least 2,000 prospectors were living in the vicinity when Carmack made his find. Hoisting their packs, they left Rabbit Creek for the mining recorder's office at 40 Mile. <laughs> Rabbit Creek was soon renamed Bonanza. This simple event triggered the Klondike Gold Rush. The next day, August 17th, was proclaimed Discovery Day, an event that's still celebrated in the Yukon Territory. The news spread, slowly at first. Bleary-eyed men rolled out of their bunks, their cabins emptied as outfits were piled ever higher on the riverbanks the oars dipped quietly into the water. And suddenly, it was every man for himself. Down into the front Longtime Yukoner, right Sourdough Sue Ward. And so they would shake it, and then they would hold her still, and then they would sluice it off and let the law of gravity pull the gravel off. Because the gold is 14 times heavier than the gravel, and so it sinks to the bottom. 
and you repeat the process and if they found that their ground was good and they wanted to stake a claim they would put a post in at one end of the ground and mark it number one put the name that they would give their claim and their own name and the date they were staking it and then they'd go 500 feet up the creek bed and a thousand feet on either side and that would give them the claim but first they had to make the trip back to the mining recorder's office and there they would have to pay ten dollars and they could work it for a year and then they get busy looking for the gold within five days fifty claims were staked a month later 200 were recorded. In the outside world, a jolt of major proportions would be required to shake off the pervading gloom and despondency. The jolt arrived on July 17, 1897. The North American Trading and Transportation Company's steamer, Portland, gave a blast from her whistle and eased into the Seattle Harbor. Within minutes, headlines screamed, a ton of gold in Seattle. You simply wash it from the creeks, they said. They said. They said. They said. They said. They said. Overnight, the stampede was on. A gold-crazed horde surged north, up the west coast, in anything that would float. A strange madness gripped the world gold fever. At least a dozen routes were proclaimed to be the easiest, the fastest, and the cheapest. The outfitters' mercenary interests got the better of them. And so what if they were wrong? Few would ever be back to complain. Only three practical routes were well tried. One via St. Michael and the Yukon River and two via the Inside Passage and Lynn Canal. Skagway, a major port in 98, is still abuzz with activity. Here the stampeders, scallywags, and scoundrels landed on their way to the gold fields. And here, they took the White Pass through Skagway, or the Chilkoot through neighboring Dai. The Chilkoot has been immortalized in photographs. The thin line of men and women climbing the golden stairs has become a Klondike trademark. Now Dai is quiet. Once a thriving town that vied with Skagway, it has almost vanished. In 98, both centers offered miners every amenity. And for a while, Dai was well ahead. The alternative route was the White Pass with Skagway at the trailhead. The town has survived the ravages of time, and it's now a major tourist center. All aboard the Skagway streetcar! Hey! <laughs> and off we go! And ladies and gentlemen, on the 29th day of that month, the SS Queen, the mail steamer, comes around the point just like you did this morning, and ties up against Captain Moore's brand new dock. 500 people become the instant population of Skagway. Before the end of the month is out, there are 5,000 here. The winter of 97-98, this is a boom town tent city of 20,000 gold crazed stampeders, and I'm gonna drive you right through the middle of Skagway in the days of 98. This is Broadway. There's eight blocks of bliss laid out right here for your entertainment, folks. <laughs> Will everybody get another couple pictures of their ship in the harbor, maybe themselves with the city in the background? We're going to make our way next down to the old Gold Rush Cemetery, where I'm going to introduce you to Jefferson Randolph Soapy Smith. All aboard the okay. As Skagway's population grew, so did the numbers of entrepreneurs ready to mine the miners. The gold seekers who disembarked from the ships were easy prey for the saloon keepers, entertainers, and gambling houses. Soapy Smith's gang of cutthroats and con artists helped increase the odds of being robbed, and in the process, cast the image of Skagway as little better than hell on earth. 
Today, his abrupt rise to power and his equally abrupt demise remains one of the most fascinating of Skagway's stories. My God, man, don't shoot! He cried. <laughs> Frank Reed, city surveyor and chief engineer of Skagway. Man who laid out all the streets we've been driving on with his survey in transit, so straight and true. Mr. Reed was from Oregon. He had been a gunfighter, he'd been an Indian fighter, frontiersman. Frank Reed was up here with everybody else, way ahead of their reputation when they got to Skagway. But that night, Frank had a six gun on his hip, and he saw Soapy coming down the dock, and he said, why should I mess with this outlaw? And he pulled that six gun out, pulled back on the hammer, and he pulled the trigger. And that would have been the end of the whole story, except for a quirk of historic fate. The hammer of his pistol fell on a faulty cartridge. Oh no, quick, Frank pulled a second time to get another round into the chamber as he did that. Soapy had just enough time to drop his Winchester off his shoulder. Both men fired simultaneously. Smith took a round in the heart. He was dead before he hit the dock. Frank Reed took a bullet in the groin that shattered his pelvis. He died 12 agonizing days later. And when he was buried, 2,000 people gathered here for the funeral services. And in February of 99, a grateful community raised up a granite monument. He gave his life for the honor of Skagway. Soapy lay dead on the end of the dock for three hours, his body forgotten. From the right, form single file. Fortunately for many, the Northwest Mounted Police were just ahead of the rush. The need for the Mounties in Canada's Northwest frontier had been decided upon at least two years before Carmack's discovery. Their arrival had other ramifications. Until now, no formal border had been established between the United States' new territory, Alaska, and Canada. First of all, we didn't know where the border was. Uh, so the Americans thought it would be way north of, uh, of uh, Skagway, uh, up near Lake Bennett, which is 12, 15 miles beyond the White Pass summit. Uh, the British, which at that time looked after Canadian foreign affairs, uh, they interpreted the Treaty of uh, St. Petersburg of 1825 as putting the border about 50, 60 miles down Lynn Canal. So this is an immense amount of land was uh, disputed territory. Such matters had been of little concern until the word gold rang through the land. Now things were different. The um, Northwest Mounted Police was dispatched by Ottawa into the Yukon Territory to maintain law and order, and uh, they did, in their true sort of British Victorian way, with their pistols properly strapped to their belts, and uh, with their buttons all shined. Uh, they took up posts at what they believed to be the boundary between Alaska and Canada, which was turned out to be exactly where it was. Here, law and order were strictly enforced. Each post was equipped with a Maxim machine gun, in case the Mounties' presence was not enough. When everybody arrived, the Americans arrived in Skagway, they all had rifles, ammunition, uh, six guns, and uh, this was the mode of operating in the, in the United States at that time. When they got to the border, the um, Northwest Mounted Police would say, Oi, you don't need that in this country. And virtually, it was just a heavy weight to carry. And along the Trail of 98, north of the border, it was littered with broken rifles and guns that had been thrown away because they were not required in Canada. The law required each man to carry sufficient supplies for a year, a requirement implemented by the Mounties that was later credited with saving the life of many a luckless prospector. The contrast between the scenic grandeur of the area and remnants of the Stampeders' efforts to tame the land make an unforgettable experience. The Slide Cemetery, sheltered beneath the trees of the Pacific Coastal Rainforest, is a poignant reminder of the unforgiving nature of the past. 
an avalanche on Palm Sunday, 1898, swept more than 50 men to their deaths. The trail begins close to the old town site, billed as the longest museum in the world, 33 miles to be exact. Every summer, the trail sees a constant flow of visitors. Accessible only by foot, the route takes from three to five days to hike. With few amenities, hikers need to be well prepared. This is actually enough food for like... Seven days. Seven days. Mm Approaching the 3,600-foot level, the summit, the climate becomes subarctic. In 98, a writer for Harper's Weekly wrote, The eye catches the movement. The mountain is alive. There's a continuous moving train. They are perceptible only by their movement, just as ants are. Never did men look so small. Martha Louise Black, who climbed the pass the same year, described it in more graphic terms. The Chilkoot is the worst trail this side of hell. Today, a single ascent is challenge enough for most. But at the time of the gold rush, it was commonplace to make the journey 20 times, up and down the pass. The alternative route was the White Pass, Regardless of which pass you took, Lake Bennett was the immediate goal. Head of navigation for the Yukon River, it's a mere 500 miles to Dawson City, heart of the Klondike. Up to 30,000 stampeders spent the winter here, waiting for the ice to melt. It did the following May, the 29th to be exact. Meanwhile, you could build a boat all you had to do was cut down the trees, haul them to a site near the water, whipsaw the lumber into planks, assemble your boat, and seal the cracks. And then, wait for the ice to melt. And when they were not building boats, they built this church. When the ice melted, the boats were launched, and the stampeders were gone. And so, too, was the congregation. The 110-mile narrow-gauge railroad to Whitehorse, Yukon Territory was completed in July of 1900. July 29th, 1900. The last spike was driven. After more than two years hard labor, the White Pass and Yukon Railroad was open for business. The Daily Alaskan described the completion of the 110-mile marathon as an epic in transportation affairs of the North. The first passenger train is through. The first to make the continuous run from Skagway to Whitehorse. Too late for the majority of the Stampeders, but not for the many thousands of tourists that travel the route today. I suppose the thing that I personally like about the White Pass is the fact that it's been operating all the way back through the Gold Rush. This is a di direct link with the Klondike Stampede of 1898. I mean, these parlor cars, many of them date back to the 1880s and the 1890s. They're, the the right-of-way itself was blasted out of the side of the cliff during the Klondike Gold Rush. This is an actual operating link back 89, 90 years, and because of that, you've got something here that's very, very special. It's, uh, there are very few companies that can claim heritage all the way back to the stampede to the Columbia.
Despite the questionable skills of the boat builders, the Mounties counted 7,124 craft and 28,000 people en route. While the trip down the river lacked the drama of the ascent of the pass, many lives were claimed by the turbulent waters. The fortunate ones who capsized and didn't drown frequently experienced an instant baptism in the icy water. One of the most treacherous sections of the river was just before Whitehorse at Miles Canyon. In 1898, 150 boats were wrecked here in a matter of days. The solution was to portage round the rapids using a rough-hewn log rail tramway. At the north end of the tramway, a rest spot was provided. The site was called Whitehorse City. In 1898, this was a virtual tent town. And two years later, it was a major center, the northern terminus of the White Pass and Yukon Railway. The White Pass and Yukon arrived in Whitehorse with the driving of the spike on June the 8th, 1900. When the rail was spiked down, the White Pass trains could connect to sternwheel steamboats on the Yukon River which would then continue on down 400 miles to Dawson City. The steamboats that the White Pass operated were early on on the river with dozens of other companies' ships, but uh, the, the buccaneering spirit of the time, uh, driving freight rates uh, uh, so far down, made it impossible for anyone to make any money. The White Pass, therefore, went into the business in a big way. They actually bought out all of the steamers on the river and formed British Yukon Navigation Company, of which the Klondike, SS Klondike, uh, was uh, a flagship of that fleet. The British Yukon ships then continued from Whitehorse downriver to Dawson and then would turn around and come back upriver, thus creating a transport system up and down river for uh, stampeders, their supplies, and for the creation of the large mining companies into the 19 teens and 20s. This was, in 1900, the completion of the dream of building the route to the Klondike, when the British capital and the Canadian and American ingenuity built the White Pass. This was their achievement. The fact that finally, after the incredible uh, hardships of the trails, of the stampede itself over Chilkoot and White Pass, a six-month odyssey was reduced to a six-day journey. During the summer of 98, over 30,000 people arrived in Dawson City. A well-prepared, if not small, detachment of Mounties and members of the military were ready to greet them. So suddenly you had uh, a force of 20 Mounties and uh, something like 30 or 40,000 people running around and the Canadian government responded and they sent up another 200 Mounties and a couple of hundred um, Canadian Army people called the Yukon Field Force. While the force was served by many outstanding officers, one name in particular stands out. Inspector Samuel Benfield Steele a large man who was picturesquely described as erect as a pine and as quick as a cat. Despite the fact that there was a commissioner and a territorial council, he was the law. In his typical straightforward way, he apparently had no problem with that and he explained it this way. The situation was before us and had to be faced. Nothing was omitted that was for the good of the community. When he left Dawson 19 months later, his warm send-off was described as being such as no man had ever received from the Klondike gold seekers. I think because of uh, the fact that they did have more than their share of lawlessness, I guess you could say, and uh, they were evident on the streets, prostitutes, gamblers, saloons by the dozen, I mean literally dozens and dozens of saloons, and uh, people knew that they were there but he maintained such control that it was just the same as, as in, in, included in his writings. He mentions people could walk the streets in Dawson in more safety than people in Montreal. And, you know, in the, back in those days, most of our cities were considered very safe places to walk around. And uh, I'm sure that was why the people responded that way. They respected authority that was good to them. 
One of the characteristics of Klondike gold is that it occurs in a free or placer state and is found in the gravels at bedrock. In the case of George Carmack's discovery, the creek bed was the exposed bedrock. Because of this phenomenon, particularly during the early years of the gold rush, it was possible for an individual miner to make a fortune. However, where the bedrock was beneath the surface, life was more difficult, particularly during the winter months. Now, the idea was to sink a shaft as a miner and go down to bedrock which was about 50 feet down, and all the ground was frozen. So you had to light a fire on the top of the ground, and it would burn all night, and you'd come out and shovel out about a foot the next day and light the fire again. You'd sink your shaft down on your claim until you hit bedrock. And then having arrived at bedrock, they would drift over in a direction to try and follow the pay streak. And in the original winters, when it was 30, 40, 50 below, they would go down the shafts and they would pick off the frozen gravel with a pick and shovel, put it in little wooden baskets, haul it over and windlass it up and then stockpile it at the side of the shaft. So in the spring when the waters ran and you could start to wash this stuff, then you did your sluicing. For those who found the gold, and many did, a variety of diversions were available to spend it. I think my very favorite is uh, Swiftwater Bill Gates. He and his girlfriend had a quarrel one night. And uh, Bill was, uh, I gather, a little bit vengeful. He decided that uh, he'd have to fix this girl and teach her a lesson. Now, he knew that she loved bacon and eggs for breakfast. Always, every morning, that's what she had. So Bill went around town the day before, all day and all night, he bought all the eggs in town at a dollar each so that his girlfriend couldn't have eggs for breakfast. He bought 2,700 eggs at a dollar each for his revenge. <laughs> the rest of the story, they tell me, that he may have even fed them to the dogs in front of his girlfriend outside the restaurant to sort of sweeten his revenge. <laughs> In July of 1899, a luxurious opera house, the Palace Grand, opened in fine style. It was built by the flamboyant Arizona Charlie Meadows, who brought everything here from Wild West shows to opera. Today, the Palace Grand is one of a number of buildings featuring turn-of-the-century entertainment that have been reconstructed by the Canadian Park Service. The spell of the Yukon was also cast on literary notables, such as Jack London and Robert Service. He's world-renowned for his poetry on the Yukon, on the North. He captures uh, a sense of what it's like to live in the North and, what, and the kinds of feelings that, that one gets from, from the North. He also captures the spirit of the gold rush, The spell of the Yukon. I wanted the gold and I sought it. Oh, I scrabbled and mucked like a, a slave. Was it famine or scurvy? I fought it. I hurled my youth into a grave. I wanted the gold. Oh, and I got it. Came out with a fortune last fall. And somehow, life's not what I thought it. And somehow, the gold isn't all. No, there's the land. Have you seen it? Say, it's the cussedest land that I know, from the big dizzy mountains that screen it, to the deep death-like valleys below. Some say God was tired when he made it. Some say, oh, it's a fine land to shun, maybe. But there's some as would trade it for no land on earth. And I'm one. The financial success of the Bard of the Yukon was such that he made more money than many of the miners. 
As for George Carmack, the discoverer of the richest placer gold find in the world, he made a modest fortune, returned home to the United States, and continued to prospect. But a second bonanza was not in the cards. <laughs>